Hello, everybody. Um, this is our Esoteric Astrology Adventure number 38. <clears throat> uh, it just so happens that number 37 had to be cut short at about 30 minutes. Um, <clears throat> I've been having some trouble with technical issues, so there are a few of the adventures in the last several, which are not the full hour in duration. But this will uh, give an opportunity to deal with some important matters, which heretofore I've not been able to discuss with the thoroughness I would like to. I will begin, uh, we're talking about the seven and the five. A steady recollection of the 12 basic energies, five major and seven minor, which are in reality uh, and apart from the astral reversion due to the great illusion, <clears throat> seven major and five minor will be of value. Well, as I was saying, sometimes it seems <clears throat> that five are major. Um, we have the five liberated created hierarch creative hierarchies and the seven minor. Um, and we have uh, other instances in which um, five, the five superior subplanes are uh, filled with uh, life and are counted um, as important for a plane, whereas the two lower subplanes are entirely receptive. We have uh, instances of the domination of the five over the seven. The creative hierarchies is probably the major one. This is five major out of the 12 and seven minor. But as DK says, there is an astral reversion. It is a, uh, a reverse type of perception, and there are really seven major and five, five minor. Now, these 12 energies, whether we consider them seven and five or five and seven, work out into human expression via the lords of the 12 signs the lords of the 12 signs, and indeed there are lords of 12 signs, although he might well have said lords of the 12 constellations, especially so. <clears throat> lords of the 12 signs and the 12 planetary, uh, 12 planetary rulers. These 12 basic em energies emanate from three sources. These 12 basic energies emanate from the seven stars of the Great Bear, which is the father aspect, <clears throat> transmitted through the seven stars of the Little Bear, which is the sun, S-O-N, aspect. They are the same energies, <clears throat> but they are modified in the Little Bear. So they are seven principal energies, but they turn out to be 14, as we will see in a later equation. <clears throat> Two of these 12 come from Sirius and three from the Pleiades. This setup, he says, if I may use such an unorthodox term, will be the condition of the major solar sphere of influence at the end of the great age of Brahma, <clears throat> as it is esoterically called. In the interim or interlude of evolution through which we are passing, and which DK says, which is an inadequate translation of an occult phrase given to a world cycle. A world cycle in this case looks very much like a Mahamandantara, as I suggested before when looking <clears throat> at the ambiguity of that term. An occult phrase given to the world cycle, to a world cycle in the Master's archives. 
These energies are stepped down into forces, which are literally 16, all told, from the angle of manifestation. I would, uh, and 16 is a very important number when it comes to manifestation. From the angle of manifestation, I would remind you, and make literally 7 plus 7 plus 2 equals 16 equals 7. In these numbers, the mystery of our evolutionary process lies hid. Well, this is a profound and difficult paragraph. <clears throat> And I cannot say that I can offer any um, truly definitive uh, interpretation. There are 12 basic energies. They appear to be stellar energies coming from three great constellations, the three superior constellations as we have sometimes called them. Seven, obviously, come from the Great Bear, and these seven are transmitted through and modified by, presumably, uh, the Little Bear. We will have to uh, study the uh, stars of the Little Bear carefully in order to see which of the seven in the Great Bear trans, are transmitted through a particular seven in the Little Bear. Is Polaris one of those stars in the Little Bear? Because after all, it is the end of the tail of the Little Bear. Probably Thuban, or Thuban, uh, having to do with the guarding of treasure, is one of the stars. And there are a number of lesser-known stars in the Little Bear, each one of which should uh, be correlated with one of the seven rays and uh, receive the energy from one of the major stars of the Great Bear. <clears throat> Two of these energies are coming from Sirius, three from the Pleiades, and that makes 12. Well, you know, we are dealing, interestingly, with the constellations of the zodiac, which are said to be the 12 major petals in the major center, the 12 petals in the major head center of the great super constellational logos called the one about whom Nog may be said. So there is a major 12 petal lotus in the head and as far as the head center is concerned, it is the major center, and the, the constellations of the zodiac uh, fill in those 12 force fields. <clears throat> the, they are very powerful in the system, it would seem, and the uh, energies of the Great Bear have to do with the seven head centers in the one about whom not may be said, and are therefore, in a sense, in a lesser uh, position. <clears throat> we have to hierarchicalize the head center. We know that uh, when it comes to the analogy in man, if we turn to a treatise on cosmic fire, page 170, we will see that the seven head centers, here they are, in spiritual man to the third initiation, are hierarchically in of lesser status than the two many pebbled lotuses, which are presumably are the absent center and the <clears throat> thousand pebbled lotus. That being the case, if the great bear represents the seven head centers, in the one about whom not may be said, then the many petaled lotuses, Ajna and especially the head center, are hierarchically superior. In which case, <clears throat> we could look at the constellations of the zodiac as being, in a sense, uh, each of them hierarchically superior to each one of the uh, of the seven stars of the Great Bear. And yet, interestingly, when we turn to a chart 
uh, in Esoteric Astrology on page 6, 10, probably, and 11. Uh, whoops. Okay. Oh, that's the wrong one. There we go. 610. <clears throat> we see that one of the stars in the Great Bear seems to be hierarchically superior to uh, three zodiacal constellations, at least in this Dorja-like figure. Whatever force center is in the highest position is considered to be the emanating source, and it is called uh, transcending rather than transmitting. So I, I think you can see the problem here about the status of the the status of the signs of the zodiac or the constellations of the zodiac relative to each of the stars of the Great Bear. Now, here's a question: Can each of the stars of the Great Bear actually be a blind or stand for a still greater ray constellation? Um, for instance, can the first ray star of the Great Bear stand for the entire Great Bear? Can the um, third ray star of the Great Bear stand for the Pleiades as a whole? Uh, this is a question because um, the question of, of actual magnitudes of power uh, comes into uh, consideration, and it is not easy to solve because often there are uh, apparent reversals in magnitude. Uh, these can be used as blinds. It is difficult to see how one particular star in the Great Bear can be more powerful than all the stars in three great constellations, such as Aries, Leo, and Capricorn. So sometimes a part is used as a blind for a whole. And that is the case, for instance, with the star Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, however we can pronounce it, uh, which is often a blind for the entire constellation of Orion. Uh, it might be, for instance, uh, if we consider the rays of Orion, one of which may be ray 6, but another of which may be ray 2, because constellations 2 have a number of major rays associated with their major aspects. If we consider the second ray star of the Great Bear, uh, Mizar, M-I-Z-A-R, to represent um, a greater constellation, that constellation might be Orion as a whole. And then perhaps we can understand how such a great constellation could work through three zodiacal constellations. Uh, they would be then Gemini, which is very close to Orion, Virgo, and Pisces. These are simply speculations. They are offered in the uh, to help clarify the task the problem or the task of finding the relative magnitudes so i consider this issue to be unresolved because in a way the the lotuses uh, in the major head center of any being could be considered more powerful than the lesser centers, lower, shall we say, in that energy system. Well, when it comes to trying to discover the correlation of the 12 planetary logoi, seven major and five minor, um, or, or non-sacred, seven sacred and five non-sacred, with these 12 emanating energies, whether they are actually from stars or whether they are from still superior uh, constellations, um, 
we can correlate the seven sacred planets with the seven major rays emanating from the Great Bear. The Great Bear as a whole seems to uh, transmit the will aspect of the rays. Maybe it is so that uh, the seven Pleiades uh, transmit the intelligence aspect and um, the, the constellation Sirius, or more likely, I would say, excuse me, I seem to be uh, on my microphone. <laughs> okay. Now I'm not anymore. All right. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the seven stars of the little bear may well transmit the soul aspect of the uh, of the race so 21 uh, 21 in all and three different aspects but we we should correlate these 12 energies with the 12 planets now it's always been fairly easy to correlate seven planetary logoi with the seven stars of the great bear and it seems to me that the seven planetary Logoi should be the seven sacred planetary Logoi, probably in relation to their soul rays rather than their monadic ray, although ultimately it could be the monadic ray. Uh, but in any case, the, the, the sacred planets would have a correlation each with one of the stars of the great bear. Uh, Bennett Nash uh, Al Qaeed, first ray star of the Great Bear, could correlate with Vulcan. Mizar with Jupiter, that's the second ray star. Alioth, the third ray star in the Great Bear, could correlate with Saturn. Uh, Magrez, the fourth ray star, could correlate with Mercury. Notice I'm using the soul rays of the planet planets. Um, <clears throat> Dube, D-U-B-H-E, fifth ray star, could correlate with Venus. Merak, uh, sixth ray star, could correlate with Neptune. And Fegda, the seventh ray star, could correlate with Uranus. Now, if we were dealing with monadic rays of the planet, which have to be somewhat speculative in some cases, then Al-Qaeda, or Bennett Nash, the first ray star, would relate to uh, Uranus monadically, a first ray monad. And Mizar would relate to Neptune, a second ray monad. And Alioth again would relate to Saturn, a third ray monad. Um, then we get to the question of whether monadic rays, major monadic rays, can be four, five, six, or seven. Well, Maybe they cannot, but subsidiary monadic rays, which do exist, can be four, five, six, or seven. So perhaps the the star Magres, uh, fourth ray star, would relate to Vulcan, fourth ray monad. Um, perhaps Dubé would relate to Mercury, a subsidiary fifth ray monad. Uh, perhaps um, Merak would relate to Venus a subsidiary sixth ray monad and when we're looking for the seventh ray monad we only have Jupiter remaining and Jupiter does have much within it connected to the seventh ray so perhaps Fegda would relate uh, monadically to Jupiter but now here's the thing um, when we're dealing with the rays of these stars which type of ray are we dealing with the seven stars of the Great Bear. Are they soul rays or are they monadic rays? Any, um, any star which has passed its fourth initiation or fifth could manifest a Maya Virupa. The idea of stellar Maya Virupas is really interesting. And these Maya Virupas uh, would be generated at a point when the being generating them 
would be working very much from the monadic level, or at least the monadic level would have a, a strong uh, influence. But for the moment, we just have to take it at face value that each one of the seven stars, major stars of the Great Bear, has a particular ray, and we are not in a position to determine which ray uh, it is, <laughs> whether personality ray, doubtful, or soul, or monadic ray. So these seven sacred planets then would be correlated with the Great Bear and also with the Little Bear because we have the father and son aspect of the same rays. Two of them would come from Sirius, and when we think about Sirius, I think the sun and the moon would be uh, important, quote-unquote, non-sacred planets to be associated there. Uh, we have actually, with respect to the constellation Sirius, considering it as more than one star, we have Sirius A and Sirius B. And Sirius A in Egyptian myth mythology, uh, my wife Tuya has done some research on this, um, Sirius A correlates with the fifth initiation, Sirius B, Sirius Black, <laughs> for those of you who are into Harry Potter, that correlates with the fourth initiation. So we have the light and the dark, and the sun and the moon seem very good symbols for that, and we would be dealing then with the non-sacred planets which are uh, veiled by the sun and the moon as related to Sirius. Now, th these, are, these are correlations, you know, attempting to correlate the 12 planets with the three major sources from which respectively 7, 2, and 3 energies emanate. Uh, there's a lot more that could be said, but certainly Sirius and the Sun uh, are very closely related. This we know because Sirius, <clears throat> the Logos of Sirius, is considered to be the initiator of our solar Logos and active in our solar system as a, an initiator on a great scale. And uh, the Sun is ruled by Leo, and there is a very important triangle of Sirius, uh, Leo, Jupiter. So we see how those energies do correlate on the basis of similarity. As for the Moon, um, you know, Sirius is sending forth, in a way, the fifth grade of hierarchy. It is a source which has much of the fifth ray in it. The fifth creative hierarchy is dual, we remember. One part of it relating to the human personality and the other part relating to the solar angelic part of man. And I believe that those two parts um, of the fifth creative hierarchy using it in a way as a symbol for Sirius, uh, correlate very well with the sun and the moon. The moon correlating with the mental elemental aspect of that um, fifth creative hierarchy, or with, as it says, the human personality, the crocodiles, the lower makara, and the sun correlating with the higher aspect, the solar angelic aspect. So I think the sun and the moon are very good uh, planetary representatives for the two energies, two major energies, which come from Sirius. Although, as I said, you know, when I'm dealing with stars in a superior position to great constellations, I am looking for a blind. I'm looking for what those stars really represent, constellations which those stars really might represent. When it comes to the Pleiades, they have very much to do with matter and mind. This is considering the Pleiades as they are normally considered and not as the source of cosmic buddhi, because the Pleiades is a great constellation with uh, a number of rays and not simply the third ray or the ray of matter and mind. And yet the Pleiades, we are told, 
confers menace to the heavenly men uh, or the uh, the planetary logoi just the way Sirius confers manus or stimulates manus in the solar logos. Let's just say that the Pleiades are active in the bestowal of manus to the heavenly men. There's a, I have to study that carefully, but there is a kind of a uh, tricky wording there so that the high status of the Pleiades is preserved. It's not really lower than Sirius at all. Sirius, the Lord of Sirius, whatever that is, is a subset of the Lord of the Pleiades. Anyway, in its matter aspect, or related to its matter aspect, three non-sacred planets uh, are all that remain, and they quite logically hold their place in relation to the Pleiades, and those are Earth, Mars, and Pluto. For Earth and Mars, we can make a very good case, because uh, the uh, relationship of Earth to the Pleiades, and especially one of the Pleiades, perhaps Maya, is long established in uh, mythology. Uh, one of the Pleiades married a mortal. That mortal was the non-sacred Earth, and therefore she hid her face in shame, which means that she there is some uh, condition in relation to that star which seems to veil or obscure it. It has to do with the third aspect of divinity. Um, as far as... Um, I'm just I'm just thinking here. You know the the one about whom naught may be said. Well, um, the Lord of the Pleiades is probably uh, the Lord which uses the Pleiades as its central source, like the solar logos uses the sun as the central source. Is probably that Lord which is called the one about whom naught may be said. And I think Ray's. Three, two, and one are involved in this Pleiadian manifestation. Certainly three and two, and since it's the hub of the wheel, ray one may be there as well. Um, there may be quite a similarity between the rays of the Earth and the rays of the Pleiades. Uh, the rays of the Earth are monadic one, soul two, personality three. Well, I think the three, two, one are there in the Pleiades, but the order there... I think cannot be ascertained, which is in the soul ray position for the Pleiades, which is the outer ray and which is the deep inner ray. But three, two, and one, I think, are involved. Well, anyway, Mars is closely involved because the Pleiades are said to be the nursemaids or the nurses of the god of war, which is Mars. See, Pleiades have much to do with the matter aspect, and these three uh, non-sacred planets do very much represent the matter aspect. Below the diaphragm, they could represent um, the uh, base of the spine center, Pluto, which also has a connection, as we've seen, with the solar plexus, the spleen, Earth, and Mars, uh, sacral, and or solar plexus. So, um, we're probably leaving Venus out of the picture because Venus is probably the solar plexus at this time of the solar logos. But anyway, Mars, Pluto, and Earth are sub-diaphragmatic planets in the solar logos, and also in man uh, rule sub-diaphragmatic centers. The Earth does rule the throat center of the average man, but it also has much to do with the spleen along with the sun. Uh, Mars, we are told, rules the solar plexus of average man, but it is sacral, I think, in relation to the solar logos. Suffice it to say, the Pleiades, with all their emphasis upon matter, um, are well um, fitted to express not only, but at least, through those three non-sacred planets. So I think the planetary lineup is pretty good with the seven, two, and three. Sirius and the Pleiades, I think, uh, uh, correlating with non-sacred planets and the Great Bear with sacred planets. Now, we come to the big issue of 
the the twelve signs. The twelve signs are also here, and one gets the impression that there must be a correlation of these major stars with the twelve signs. How shall we go about? Um, how shall we go about doing that? Well, um, we and 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 how shall we keep? Uh, uh, not uh, how shall we keep the particular greater constellation correlated with only um, one of the signs? In other words, how shall we keep a star within a particular constellation correlated with only one of the signs? There are seven major stars in the Great Bear, presumably correlated with one of the seven zodiacal constellations. Two energies in um, Sirius presumably correlated with two of the zodiacal constellations, and the three energies of the Pleiades presumably correlated with three um, zodiacal constellations. Um, this is difficult because, you know, on page 50 of this book, we are at least uh, given uh, two constellations each for Great Bear, Sirius, and the Pleiades. I added another one. And then DK talked about how all of that vectors out. Uh, there are three great vectors. The first ray vector uh, working through Leo, the second ray through Pisces, and the third ray through Capricorn. But when it comes to correlating one of the 12 basic energies each with one of the signs of the zodiac or one of the constellations, that is more difficult. And I, you know, I could try to work something out there, but I'm not really going to attempt to hazard too much of a guess. Um, when you think about Taurus, Cancer, and Virgo, they are very connected uh, with the Pleiades, for sure. Now, of course, one, one way of doing this is simply to take the ray of the star concerned and relate it to the constellation. For instance, there is a first-ray star in the Great Bear. We could simply relate it to the major first ray constellation, which is Aries. We could take the second ray star and relate it to the major at this time second ray constellation of Virgo. We could take the third ray star uh, and relate it, let us say, to the sign Cancer, which uh, for the mass brings in the third ray particularly. The fourth ray star could be related to Scorpio, which at this time is the major uh, expression of the fourth ray. The fifth ray uh, star could be related to Leo, but you see the problem is Leo is giving way to Aquarius in terms of the transmission of the fifth ray. So the problem of mutation enters here. The sixth ray star, Merrick, could be associated with Sagittarius although usually it's associated with Aries from a different perspective. And the seventh ray star could be associated with Capricorn. All right, that would be one way of doing it, because DK has told us the constellations through which the seven rays majorly express at this time. For instance, we have uh, Aries, Leo, and uh, Capricorn for the first ray, but the major expression of the first ray at this time is through Aries. Now, the triangle might rotate, and at another time, the major expression could be through Leo or Capricorn, and that's the problem. So I don't know if we can find any hard and fast uh, connection here. Maybe we can find a connection between these 12 basic energies and the constellations at this time. For instance, Leo is very connected with uh, Sirius, and uh, the Syrian festival every year is associated with the full moon in Leo, and it's celebrated at that time. And maybe one of those potencies 
let's call it the sun potency of the two potencies that come through uh, Sirius could be connected with Leo. Uh, what then would the moon potency be connected with? Uh, Leo is the fire sign of consciousness, so of the three fire signs, it carries the second ray aspect, even though that particular ray is not transmitted through it. Uh, when it comes to the moon, shall we focus on the fourth ray uh, for the veiled planet there? And if we did, would we look at one of the fourth ray signs? The only one that would be left to deal with is Taurus, but then that may be used already by um, by the Pleiades. So I think you can see the problem here. Uh, we get into a kind of a speculation, and we get into the idea that there are 36 factors. Let me put that down. 36 factors. Uh, no. Um, okay. Let me just put that in. 36 factors. What are these 36 factors? They are seven great stars, three and two, twelve great stars, seven from the Great Bear, three from Pleiades, two from Sirius. Then there are twelve signs of the Zodiac and twelve planets, seven sacred, five non-sacred. That's thirty-six. Okay. Um, those thirty-six factors are hierarchicalized, so that the stars seem to occur in the superior position. The, uh, the zodiacal constellations next in order, relating to the soul, just as the stars probably relate to the spirit aspect, and then come the 12 of the planets, which archetypally uh, relate to the personality aspect, at least in this setup. The 36 gives us the 9 of a completed system. Okay, so um, what I've tried to do here is kind of uh, outline the picture uh, that we are trying to create and um, point to the major 12 as 12 stars, which may well be representatives of 12 greater sources. I'm not sure what they are, of course. But I, I'm one of those people that tries to stick strictly to magnitude. In other words, I assume the Buddha's aura is bigger than my own. <laughs> if it expands miles, it can be noticed as expanding miles. In, in other words, its display, its type of expression is equivalent to the inner power of the Buddha's being and consciousness. I assume this same to be true for stars. If you have an incredibly brilliant star, it is likely that the being behind it is a very powerful being. Of course, there's, there is one factor that enters because when you look at the chakra system of man, sometimes let's say the solar plexus is totally radiant and the heart is not. And that has to do, even though the heart is a superior center, it hasn't reached the developmental phase when its radiance will show. Perhaps at that time, the solar plexus area will have dimmed down. And the being behind or embodying the solar plexus is really a lesser being than the being embodying the heart, even though at a particular time, that being of the solar plexus seems more radiant. So there is a relativity here which one has to keep in mind. But in general, if I see a bright aura in a human being, a great uh, radiant uh, halo and uh, extensive radiation, I'm going to assume that that being has power and great consciousness. And in general, it is so with stars. If I see a brown dwarf star or a red dwarf star, I'm going to assume that the being who embodies that star is of lesser scope than a being that embodies a star like one of the three stars in the belt of Orion. Uh, 
al nilan al nitak al tak in mintaka those three stars are so brilliant they're hundreds of thousands of times brighter than the sun i'm going to assume that a being in back of them is a stupendous life when compared to the being of our sun uh, it would not make sense to me to put it the other way around it would be very should we say in a way heliocentric <laughs> and we have to overcome not only our geocentricity but our heliocentricity all right well i've laid out some thoughts here which certainly bewilder me so i hope they do the same for you <laughs> Okay, this setup, if I may use such an unorthodox term, will be the condition of the major solar sphere, which presumably is the ring past knot spherically of our solar logos at the end of the great age of Brahma. The, the relationships between the 36 will be very well defined and very uh, clearly understood as they are not completely so at the moment. The, uh, the 12 planets, five of which are non-sacred, all of them, I presume, will be sacred. And when I look at the constellations of the zodiac, I don't for a minute think that the law of seven sacred and five non-sacred will be breached. I, I believe there will be, um, um, at the moment, there are, are, are seven sacred and five non-sacred, or should we say, the constellations of the zodiac are uh, unevenly developed, but I do think that even the ones that are non-sacred now, even though they may hierarchically maintain their lesser status when compared with the greater seven, that they will be sacred too. And there may be uh, stars, I'm not sure about this, but stars within the greater twelve of the great bear Sirius and Pleiades, some stars of which are still uh, in their own initiatory scheme non-sacred and they will probably be sacred as well but by the end of the great age of brahma 311 40 311 trillion 40 billion years there will be a very clear lineup between the 36 factors here mentioned and uh we still have perhaps more than 150 trillion years to run in the manifestation of our second major solar system by our second ray solar logos. That doesn't mean it will all take place on the physical plane. There are higher planes uh, in relation to which the solar system can be said to function, and perhaps the physical plane will disappear altogether. The word world cycle, uh, as I said, you know, it might mean one uh, processional age, uh, a platonic age of 25,000 years, that's unlikely. Um, but it can easily mean a round of some hundreds of millions of years, uh, or it can mean a, a chain, uh, a, 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 a scheme round, which is a still vaster period of time. But the word world is a generic word, and even the universe is considered the world in a way. Um, and so is our solar system. So a world cycle might be one entire Maha Manvantara. It's an ambiguous word that DK can use in order to somewhat disguise the specific truth uh, from us. Anyway, in the interim of evolution, which is the duration of a world cycle, which ultimately is a Mahamanvantara, uh, the energies uh, which we've been talking about, these energies are stepped down toward uh, 16 in all. Now, are we talking about the 36 energies or the 12? We do have an analogy in the Egoic Lotus, which has is a heart center. Um, it's, it's in the line of heart centers, as we have discussed. The, we have the 12-petaled human heart center, the 12-petaled heart in the head, then we have the 12-petaled Egoic Lotus, and uh, we would assume the monad has petals too, but the number of them still has to be determined. Could be 12, could be 16. 
um, when we, we can use the egoic lotus as an analogy because it has, uh, strictly speaking, um, 16 parts. It's a kind of a throat center in a way. It's kind of the expression of the word. The word comes from the throat, which has 16 petals. Um, it's a heart center, and so when we think of it, we think of it as 12-petal lotus, but if we see that it has drawn one aspect from a superior world, that is, from the world of the monad, it has drawn the jewel and the lotus, and from the inferior worlds, it has drawn the three constituents of the atomic triangle, the mental unit, astral permanent atom, mental permanent atom, add those all together, you get 16. So that is one example, at least, of how the 12, which is the heart, can in manifestation, which is related to the throat, the throat center being a third ray, seventh ray center in a way, when it's ruled by Uranus, seventh ray, um, that throat can be the manifestation of the heart. So the 12 of the heart can become the 16 of the throat in manifestation. And the love must be expressed through intelligence and the word and in manifestation, which is very close to the number seven, because the 16 petals resolve to seven. So it shows the throat center to be a center of manifestation. So uh, we, are, we are looking at the number 16, but the way the Tibetan derives the 16 is different. He derives them with a seven plus seven plus two equals 16 equals seven. Well, uh, in terms of what he has mentioned in this little section, there are seven from the great bear, seven uh, energies from the little bear, that's 14 altogether, plus two from Sirius. We have great bear, little bear, Sirius equals 16 equals seven. So we see that 16 is truly a number of manifestation. And when you think about 16 and you interpret it in a different way, you have the one surrounded by the six which is what we find on the cosmic physical plane, or on many different planes. We always find one plane surrounded by six planes, and that's the method of its manifestation. All the six are deriving from the power of the one. Now, we have mentioned the three energies of the Pleiades, but we haven't added them in. And if we did, we wouldn't get a seven, we'd get a 19. Seven great bear, seven little bear, two serious, three Pleiades equals 19 equals one, which points to the centrality of the Pleiades in this setup. So DK says that, that in, this, in these numbers, the mystery of our evolutionary process lies hid. Well, yes, it is hidden. It is deep. We have some hints. We have the idea that our evolutionary process is uh, started from these super constellations. And I, one almost wants to add the sun into that picture. One wants to see the, the, the three super constellations, uh, Great Bear, Pleiades, Sirius, or really, uh, what I would rather see is Great Bear, Little Bear, Sirius, funneling into, no, that's wrong. That's not what I meant. Great Bear, Little Bear, Pleiades. Okay, that is a great triangle. And DK does talk about the importance of that triangle. Um, maybe I can find that. Um, he does say that uh, Ursa Minor Major Pleiades, yes, what does he say? Uh, These facts contain a great mystery connected with the interrelation of Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, and the Pleiades. They constitute one of the greatest and most important of the triplicities to be found in the heavens as far as we have ast astronomically ascertained the nature of our immediate universe. He's leaving open the fact that we do not have complete knowledge at all 
of our immediate uh, universe. Notice how the word universe is used as an immediate area of space and not as the vast mm, entirety. So anyway, I would like to see a triangle here of great bear, little bear Pleiades, yes, funneling through that lesser being, Sirius, would be a dwarf star when compared with the greater constellations there, and then funneling through our planetary, our solar locus, five altogether. And as a matter of fact, what could be considered is a setup with the great bear, uh, little bear Pleiades, working through the constellation of our local cosmic logos which hypothetically includes the very close star Sirius along with our Sun and five other uh, major solar logoi within the constellation representing that cosmic logos. Then we would have four super constellations. And, oh yes, think of it. Wow, that would be a really good setup, and it would look exactly like this. I, now, I think I've hit on something here, maybe, after all these years, possibly. Look at this tabulation, which we have examined. Great Bear, Sirius, Great Bear, Pleiades, and one constellation of magnetic energy called the seven solar systems of which ours is one. Uh, presumably, uh, uh, we can include uh, seven stars in that system. Should Sirius be included and do double duty? I'm not sure. But certainly, seven stars can be included there. And they will be a magnetic constellation in relation to three great constellations. And what I'd like to do for the three great constellations, I would like to substitute the little bear for Sirius. Both of them, I think, have a strong uh, kind of agenda center connection, and both of them represent the sun, S-O-N, and both of them represent, therefore, the Christ force. Well, you know, uh, as I have read through this, this section of the book a number of times over many years, maybe mm, maybe 40 years, something like that, maybe more. Um, I've always been bewildered. <laughs> and I've always, I've never taken the time to intricately look at this section of the book. And, and I have entered now into a greater degree of intricate consideration than heretofore. But, but we must not discount, uh, discount the power of the little bear. He doesn't say much about it, but I do think it is a kind of higher prototype to Sirius in a way. And often when Sirius is mentioned, I think it is the little bear which uh, should be receiving attention. In any case, in this particular paragraph, we do have Great Bear, Little Bear, Sirius, and Pleiades, the major um, sources in our local cosmos system. If we exclude the energies from the Pleiades, we get seven, and if we include them, we get 19 or one. One, and one plus nine is uh, 10 or one. So we have the one and seven. We have the the sources which account for the uh, structural nature of our local cosmos system. And I think, uh, yes, I think it makes sense that the 12 can manifest as a 16. Now, interestingly enough, if it was 36 manifesting as 16, that would make sense too, because we'd have the 36, which would be the 9, the 9 being the number of the third aspect, and then we would have the, the 7 from the 16, and the 7 being the number of manifestations. So we'd have the relationship of the 3 and the 7. 
and nine being the number which represents the three and the seven. Uh, but from another point of view, well, all right, 36 is nine and seven is 16 is seven. So we keep on coming to the idea of the third aspect and manifestation. Um, I, I know we have to be careful with numerology because it might be easy to make it say anything. But in this particular case, DK is working with numerology for a specific reason. He's talking about the manifestation, which involves the third aspect and the number seven of the sun, or the second aspect, with which the number 12 is associated. 12 Pisces, the heart, the son of God. Whoa. Uh, that was a paragraph, and uh, <laughs> even though Esoteric Astrology 37 began that process, I think pretty much Esoteric Astrology uh, Adventure 38 is there as well. Uh, it took a while to get through that paragraph, and I have a feeling that we have only scratch the surface. Um, let's see here. Am I, I seem to yeah, I seem to have lost. There we go. Okay. Yeah, we are coming to the point where the great invocation uh, can be said. We have just three minutes left. I will read the next uh, paragraph and I'll begin there with 39. Always, however, the, ray, the emphasis must be laid upon the rays of energy and quality, even when discussing astrology, as they pour through the zodiacal constellations and the planets. So the rays are somehow in the setup. They represent the spirit aspect. In, in a treatise on white magic, he did the same. He talked about the seven solar lords being superior to the signs of the zodiac. The new astrology is, therefore, is necessarily based upon an understanding of the rays. In other words, if we want to understand the 12 of astrology, we have to understand the 7 of the rays. And I have, uh, oh, oh, I know what I didn't do. Yes, I wanted to show you the derivation of the 7 from the 12. And I think I'll do that. I think I can include that. And we'll deal with the following tabulation in a bit. But here's the 7 from the 12. Because that's so important uh, when thinking of the uh, preeminence of the 7 of the Great Bear and the 12 of the Zodiacal Constellations. The 12 creative hierarchy. Students are often puzzled in trying to account for the 12 in Cosmos. A correspondent sent in the following suggestion. Um, remember, the seven rays derive from the three. There's A, there's B, there's C, there's AB, AC, and BC, and then ABC in equal measure. Um, but now he's dealing with the twelves. Uh, in a study of consciousness, the three, ABC, by an arrangement of internal groupings, show seven groups. Um, so this is what I just said, uh, but there, but there is a different way in which we always preserve each of the three as we work: A B C, A C B, B C A, B A C, C A B, C B A, and the seventh, a synthesis in which the three are equal. They don't have uh, any um, uh, order. Uh, so, so to speak. Uh, none of them is preeminent. All of them is equal. Now that's uh, six plus the equal equal one. A second six would be represented by paren a b then c. C paren a b. Um, we're using here the principle of ordinality uh, so that that which precedes is considered uh, significant, and that which follows is considered significant. So when we we are reversing the ordinality, uh, we have C per N A B, A per N B C, B C per uh, B C per N A, uh, C A per N B, B per N A C. 
So we have the two bracketed groups being equal and the third stronger or weaker. Uh, so we're talking about relative strengths as we make these combinations. Now we've got two groups of six and a group in which the three are equal, which would make 13. The 13 may be arranged in a circle of 12 with one in the center, uh, presumably the one in which equality is demonstrated. The central one will be synthetic and will be that class in which all three are equal. The physical correspondence to this will be the 12 signs of the zodiac with the sun at the center synthesizing all of them. Or the mm, spiritual correspondence is the 12 creative hierarchies with the logos at the center. Uh, the arrangement is quite legitimate. Okay. Uh, this came from the Theosophist, and I would recommend its study on page 1195 of Fies on Cosmic Fire because probably if we're very careful, we can work out which of the combinations represents the seven rays and which of the combinations represents each of the 12 signs of the zodiac. It would be a big job, but I think it could be done, and it's maybe something for someone in the new esoteric schools <laughs> coming along. All right. Now we will sound the great invocation. And from the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men, let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Okay, friends, that's that. That's that. End of uh, esoteric astrology adventure number 38. And we will continue with 39. Okay. We will see you then.